Thank you for downloading this episode of A History of Central Florida podcast. This is the podcast where we explore Central Florida's history through the artifacts found in local area museums and historical societies. This series is brought to you by Riches, the regional initiative to collect the histories, experiences, and stories of Central Florida and the Orange County Regional History Center. I am Bethany Dickens, and I will be your host for today's episode titled Time Pieces. Time. It is an abstract concept, and the keeping of uniform time is a distinctly modern phenomenon. This week's podcast focuses on three distinct time pieces from the early 20th century. It appears that they all have the same function to tell time. These three watches were owned by very different people. One was a railroad conductor, another a farmer, and finally a civil rights organizer. The recording of time existed before railroads. You can go back thousands of years in human civilization to the use of sundials to track time in the ancient world. Dr. Mark Long from the University of Central Florida explains how people might have interpreted time before the clock or watch. It's funny, I mean, the, the clock itself is, it's so, and the watch is so common to us now. It's just so much a part of our, our daily um, existence that we forget how profoundly revolutionary in some ways the clock was, the timepiece was. Until the 19th century, I mean, time was a concept for most people that was natural uh, and or God-given, and that flowed in very sort of broad uh, ways, right? We, we think of times... Um, mostly, I mean, the sort of most significant way in which we divided time would be, you know, morning and afternoon and night. Beyond that, it would be seasonal um, or weekly and then seasonal. And so we didn't see time as something that can be segmented in small bits. And importantly, that could be commodified. It's really the 19th century, 1825 to 1925, right? The long century there that uh, that time becomes uh, not just something that can be divided um, into ever uh, more discrete units. Uh, but more importantly, that the ability to, to do that uh, takes on a cultural power be- because it becomes a kind of disciplining tool, right? So the rise of factory production, the, the use of time, the segmentation of time, uh, and the commodification of time becomes central to the way in which life is organized in, in the industrial United States and increasingly in, in rural U.S. as well. Without a uniform system of time, this led people to understand the passing of the day in multiple and varied ways. Dr. Alexis McCrossan from Southern Methodist University describes how the location of the sun and the location of a town determine the time of day. In the 1850s, there wasn't a standard notion for time. There wasn't a standard way of measuring or of telling the time. Time was an intensely local phenomenon that was determined by by the point of the sun at its zenith, at its at the highest point at its meridian, and so that would be noon. And every town would have a different noon because every town is located in a slightly different place on the, on on the Earth's surface. The mid nineteenth century was also the time of the industrial revolution which impacted Europe and North America profoundly. More people became clock conscious. Clocks came to represent a national work ethic and spirit of industry. The standardization of time was an important development during this period. Factories, transportation networks, people from all walks of life, including workers, bosses, merchants, and consumers needed to coordinate events throughout the day. Thus was born a uniform system of time. Dr. McCrossan explains how the United States settled on a new system to measure time. On November 18, 1883, it was a Sunday, a system of standard time, which is very similar to the one we live with today, was introduced. The United States was divided into four time zones, and um, those time zones were set to the meridian time of the 75th, the uh, 90th, the 105th, and the 120th um, meridians are the lines of longitude. And those, um, those time zones, then all the communities in them would follow the time of that particular meridian. 
At the center of this need for standard time were railroads, which brings us to our first watch, the conductor's watch on display at the Central Florida Railroad Museum. Trains could not estimate their arrival and departure times because these times needed to be exact. Philip Cross, the president of the Central Florida chapter of the National Railroad Historical Society, explains why. Railroad watches have been around probably, I, I'm guessing, maybe 1860s. So, so railroad watches have been around, but the importance of a watch is the railroads operated on a schedule. And everybody needed to be on the same time because before there was telegraph and, and other forms of communication, if a train had to meet another train at a certain time, at a certain siding, everybody's watch had to be the same so that you were at that location at the designated time. Otherwise, you might wind up having what they called a cornfield meet or a head-on train crash. A railroad conductor's pocket watch, like the one at the Central Florida Railroad Museum, would be one of the most important devices owned by a railroad employee. Here, Philip Cross tells us how watches were more than just tools for the station agent recording the departures and arrivals of trains. Every railroad employee was required to carry a watch because the railroads ran on schedule. Even the maintenance of way folks, the guys who went out and repaired the tracks, kept them in tip-top order, they needed to know what time it was to know when the trains would be coming by and they would be clear of the track to allow the trains to pass and then they could go back to work repairing the track. All the railroads required the watches to be uh, checked at least once a month by a company watch shop. And if that um, watch was out of time more than whatever the designated number of seconds was, that watch had to be uh, recalibrated to ensure that it kept accurate time. You might think this uniformity of time would create consensus across different groups of people throughout the United States. But Dr. McCrossin tells us how important it was to have a notion of time that was accepted by a variety of different people. Employers sometimes would try to trick their workers or deceive them so they would they would not have any timepieces in the factory and they would maybe short the worker by 20 minutes or by a certain amount of time claiming that the worker had only worked, say, 9 hours and 30 minutes instead of 10 hours. And if the workers themselves didn't have their own timepieces, they had no way to contest this assessment of how long the workday had been. And so what standardized time did is it, it provided an, a, a neutral source of time, right? So it wasn't the boss's clock that was providing the time, and it wasn't the worker's clock, but there was a neutral source for the standard of time, and everyone's watches or, and clocks could be set to that. Even entire towns resisted this change as described by Dr. Long. Now, a lot of towns resisted this. Certainly any town without a railroad uh, said that, you know, it didn't apply to them. Uh, they weren't interested because they had no need to bend their local time to the interests of the, of the, um, of the rail companies. Uh, and even some towns with railroads, there was a, lot, a great deal of sort of cultural tension within that town. People who refused to bow to the power of the railroads, they saw this as an overreach of sort of American corporations dictating to them when noon is, because in their world, in many cases, that, you know, that's determined by God, not by railroad magnates. Over time, of course, that wins. I mean, we're all now calibrated to the same time, regardless of when the sun is overhead. Although a watch is a device to tell time, it can also symbolize something much more about the owner of the watch. The watch on display at the Museum of Geneva History was owned by a dairy and citrus farmer named J.T. McLean who probably bought it in the late 19th century. This shift in standardized time also impacted agricultural communities like Geneva. McLean needed a watch during this time to know when the railroad would arrive so his farm goods could get to market. But this watch was more than just a timepiece. It was gold and came with a handcrafted hair chain. Dr. McCrossin speculates what this watch might have meant to McLean. 
he probably would have prided himself on carrying this beautiful gold watch and on having it set to the correct time because that, that itself was a sign of regularity, a sign of a kind of reliability that a merchant would definitely want, want to um, exude that kind of stability and that kind of status of always having the right time. Our last watch was owned by the civil rights activist Harry T. Moore and is on display at the Harry and Harriet Moore Memorial Park. It is hard to believe but a watch would prove an invaluable resource in the struggle for equal rights in Florida. Not only did standardized time provide a valuable resource for organizing transportation and factories, but protests as well. Harry Moore was an extremely busy man in the 1940s. As a member of both the NAACP and Progressive Voters League, he worked to establish branches in the central Florida area. Ben Green, author of Before His Time, The Untold Story of Harry T. Moore, explains the activist's busy schedule. Well, Harry T. Moore spent 17 years uh, as an activist traveling the state of Florida, building the Florida NAACP. He had just one meeting after another, and what he did was he didn't just, some of these would be big scheduled meetings for a local chapter of the NAACP, but also he just worked the community. So he would be going from barbershop to church social to uh, meeting with some school teachers, and he was doing this nonstop from one town to the next. So he might, in central Florida, he might be leaving his home in Brevard County and traveling to Orlando and from there to uh, Apopka and from there up into Lake County to Leesburg and then making the loop back. So he he had a constant sequence of events that he had to get to and um, his calendar was sort of lined with meeting after meeting after meeting. In order that he might be successful, more depended upon his watch to trust he was always on time. Today, the segmentation of time is second nature to the average person. Time plays a key role in our lives, though we scarcely seem to notice its existence. The railroad conductor, the farmer, and the activist were not just Floridians living around the same time. They were instead men birthed in a modern world defined by the structure of organized timekeeping. Now, Americans can only complain about the tyranny of the clock, though we cannot remember a time when it did not play a pivotal role in our lives. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of A History of Central Florida podcast. If you would like to see these and other items that tell the history of Central Florida, you can visit the Museum of Geneva History at 165 First Street, Geneva, Florida, 32732, the Central Florida Railroad Museum at 101 South Boyd Street, Winter Garden, Florida, 34787, and the Harry and Harriet Moore Memorial Park at 2180 Freedom Avenue, Mims, Florida, 32754. Please join us for our next episode titled Russian Samovar. Mm-hmm.